This program is brought to you by Emory University. Mr. President, Most Reverend Archbishop, Mrs. Dean, Dr. Thompson, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to be once again in the United States and to have once again the opportunity to exercise my very own craftsmanship that is to give lectures at universities as I had done for almost 30 years, for some time also in this wonderful country. I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude for the invitation to come to this renowned and distinguished university, which I consider an honor, and I thank you for the warm welcome you have given to me. Before I came here, I was told that in the United States, you have to speak about the real problems, not about the mystery of God, but about the mysteries of the Vatican. <laughs> but there is no shortage of speakers on this kind of problems, and I do not want to carry coals to Newcastle. <laughs> so I have chosen another issue, which I think is the most central and fundamental question of theology and perhaps also the most challenging problems for the theology today. Not the church question, as important it may be, but the question on God. Because I am convinced that not only our personal existence, but also all that we say about the church, or what we may say about ethical values, depends on the God question. It means whether God is a reality and how we speak about this reality which we call God. All traditional cultures presuppose the reality of the divine. But as a famous Jewish philosopher Martin Buber wrote, and I quote, God is the most heavy laden of all human words. None has become so soiled and mutilated, human beings with their religious factions have torn the world to pieces, they have killed for it and died for it, and it bears their finger marks and their blood. They draw caricatures and write God underneath. They murder one another and say in God's name. End of quotation. These lines were written more than 50 years ago, but today they are more acute as perhaps never before. God cannot only be understood in very, diff can be understood in very different ways, but the name of God can also be used and misused in various ways. And misusing the name of God can be much more dangerous than denying God. Modern atheism is to a great, ext great extent a reaction to such misuse of God in order to legitimate oppression, unjust power, structures, or wars. As a consequence, at least in Europe, practical and theoretical atheism alike were for a long time regarded as a keynote of the age. The Second Vatican Council, too, considered atheism to be among the most serious phenomena of our times. Then, in the 70s and 80s in Western Europe, the secularization thesis was able to gain a full foothold, claiming that the inexorable march of modernization processes would be, process would be its very nature inevitably result in progressive secularization. So faith in God seemed to be a lost cause. Today, atheism is by no means that. It has reappeared in the guise of science and with nothing short of missionary zeal. Books such as Richard Dawkins' God Delusion rank on the bestseller lists. We can, of course, question 
whether this kind of atheism is not itself a lost cause. It reiterates in a heavy-landed and distorted manner 19th century positions which have long been considered a thing of the past. It is essentially an atheistic fundamentalism. In serious publications, the secularization thesis, which enjoyed a boom in the 70s and 80s, has since been largely abandoned. Within Western Europe, these developments are interwoven with self-critique in the form of a dialectic of the Enlightenment, which has also led to a dialectic of secularization. And this was the theme of a famous public dialogue between the then Cardinal Josef Ratzinger with the well-known philosopher Jürgen Habermas in 2004. All the ideologies and utopias of progress of the 19th and 20th centuries have failed. This is true with regard to Marxism and to Western theories of unilateral scientific and technological progress as well. The internal ambivalence, ambivalence of modern progress has been recognized. It has become evident that it cannot be had without a cost, that in fact each gain has to be paid for, for with a loss. It is most clearly manifest in the serious ecological problems we face and which are the price we pay for technological progress. It is also doubtful whether the development from the slingshot to the atom bomb can be defined as human progress. One-sided rationalism causes the emotional and aesthetic di dimensions of humanity to atrophy and cannot answer the existential quest for meaning which constitutively belongs to the human existence and makes it precisely human. There are very few people who want to live in a purely rational, technologically functional world. So the dimensions of the emotions and aesthetics are sought once more, extending as far as a renewed interest in myth. Furthermore, rapid change in practically all spheres of life gives rise once more to the question of what is permanent, what we can hold on to. So the primordial religious questions of meaning and security have once more become burning new questions for many. Religious and spiritual questioning and seeking are on the increase. There are many people, more than we think, who can be described as seekers and pilgrims. God has, as it were, become socially acceptable once more. Religion and the religions have to a large extent not declined as envisaged by the Enlightenment critique of religion, but have been shown to be virtually anthropological constants. That is a theological and pastoral opportunity, which we must grasp by offering compelling theology and proclamation. This new situation is, of course, ambivalent. It has given theology and the churches some breathing space, but it does not by any means signify that we are out of the woods. As we have seen, we are witnessing not only the return of religion, but also the return of atheism and atheistic propaganda. Therefore, it is debatable whether we are speaking of a post-secular situation or a so-called return of religion or even of a megatrend towards religion. In any case, this so-called return of religion does not simply lead back to Christian faith in God. Often, it leads to an individualistic, invisible religion, to a vague, diffuse, free-floating religiosity a syncretistic do-it-yourself, what-you-will religiosity, which narcissistically seeks the divine not above us, but in us. 
to some extent also the so-called third wave of Christianity belongs in this postmodern context. It means the charismatic and Pentecostal churches, the proliferation of independent churches and similar phenomena which are growing very fast and nowadays can be found all over the world. They too represent, even if practiced in so-called megachurches, an individualistic religiosity of people who feel lost and lonely in a society where former solid social and religious institutions and sense of belonging are breaking down. Finally, God can be and is often practically used as cement and sanction of a given society, of a cult culture and a nation, even of wars, which then become ideological crusades against the evil in the world. Or we find under the banner of a return to religion the phenomenon which is rightly observed by many with great fear and anxiety, a fundamentalistic religion which out of hate commits violence and distorts religion into its daimonic opposite because violence is an offense to God and to human dignity. So, it is right to question, is it really always and in every case God who is returning? Are we not in many instances dealing instead with the return of old and new gods. The famous sociologist the Max Weber wrote, and I quote, the old gods ascend from their graves. They are disenchanted and thus take the form of impersonal forces. They strive to gain power over our lives and again they resume their eternal struggle with one another. In this situation, theology has a chance. There is a new openness to the religious message, but theology faces also a new challenge. Theology cannot become involved uncritically in the so-called religious megatrend and its ambiguities. In this situation, theology must be aware of its own hermeneutical principles and only in this way it can have a critical and at the same time a constructive standpoint of its own and open itself in a responsible way to other faiths. Theology means rational responsibility for speaking of God. Indeed, theology means nothing than logos of theos. The term logos tells us that theology is not rhetorically, dynamic, and charismatically aesthetic speech about God, and it is certainly not theolalia, babbling about God. Faith is, as St. Paul tells us, intellectual worship, logike latreia, rationale obsequium. Faith should give account, apologia, of the hope that is within us. So the first letter of Peter. So already the first fathers of the church, for example, Justine, did not refer to what the ancient world understood as theology, the mythical or poetic way to speak about God or gods. They knew that not only faith, but also reason is a gift of God, and therefore they referred to the enlightened Asian philosophy and its rational God talk. They did so when they identified the name of God, Yahweh, who was revealed to Moses in the burning bush, with the understanding of God of Hellenistic philosophy. Therefore, according to St. Augustine and Anselm of Canterbury, the father of medieval scholastic theology, theology is fides querens intellectum, Faith seeking understanding. Saint Bonaventure, the great theologian, alongside Thomas Aquinas in medieval theology, tells us of the inner reason why faith seeks understanding. He tells us that what we love, we want also to understand. 
Their theology, therefore, is logical, rational speech about God. In recent times, Pope John Paul II, in his encyclical letter of Fates et Ratio, 1999, reminded us, and since the new Pope Benedict XVI, his well-known Regensburg Lecture 2006, emphasized this logical structure of Christian faith, which excludes any purely emotional or any fundamentalistic and fanatical, and much less to say, any violent expressions of faith. Christian mission is intrinsically dialogical. It means it respects the personal conviction of another person and tries to convince him or her with arguments and with a personal witness of one's own life. Second point, the liberating God of Jesus Christ. At this point, we have to add another fundamental aspect of Christian God talk. We can speak of God in many different ways. The God of the Bible is not an intuitive intimation of a divine which being with, uh, uh, of divine being which remains vague and indeterminate, not a pale idea of divinity as an ultimate but ultimately incomprehensible horizon or beyond all things. No irrational remnant in the face of the unelectable contingency of existence. The God of the Bible reveals himself in concrete history. It means he communicates not something, but himself in concrete time and space. Christian theology, therefore, has to speak of the God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush, bush of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of the God of Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, God entered into our history, becoming frail human flesh, like us in all things except our sin. And he feel with us. A benevolent and merciful God has been shown upon the countenance of Christ, who has made God manifest to us as his father and our own father. And in so revealing himself, he revealed also what we are. It is sons and daughters of God. But immediately a grave objection is raised against this historical premise. The question is, in focusing on the Judeo-Christian tradition, do we not banish ourselves into a Judeo-Christian ghetto, where we are no longer able to dialogue with other religions and to perceive the many other diverse ways of speaking of God, barricading ourselves into an arrogant, exclusive claim to, uh, to own the absolute truth, and then running the risk of behaving in a fundamentalistic way, fanatically, if not violently against others. Today, the monotheistic religions have come under the suspicion of being violent, a charge which is directed against Islam and Christianity as well. The theme of God and violence, or religion and violence, has become topical, particularly since the 11th September 2001. We sense a new wave of intolerance against a presumed intolerance of Christianity. One way out is offered by the proponents of a pluralistic religious theology. Their thesis that there are multiple approaches to the divine which all in principle have equal rights it must abandon any claim to be absolute because of the divine remains transcendent in the face of all cognitive comprehension seems at first glance to be plausible. But one must, of course, also be aware of all conflict avoidance of this kind. It is, possi it is only possible at the price of the preceding suicide of the monotheistic religions. Confessing the one and only God, 
is constitutive for both the Old and New Testament. And the primary commandment to love this one God with all our heart and all our strength excludes a polytheism or a theoretical religious pluralism. Such an irrevocable claim to the absolute and universal validity is a defining characteristic of Judeo-Christian and, and Islamic monotheism alike. To abandon it would not serve dialogue, but would instead rob dialogue of all substance. Before commencing dialogue, not only would the monotheistic dialogue pattern have been abolished, but the door would be opened to a general religious relativism. The biblical testimony to God directs us along another path. On the first page of the Bible, we already find a viewpoint which is in no way particularist, but rather universal. There, the God of Israel is introduced as a creator of heaven and earth. Thus, in the whole of reality, traces of his wisdom are to be found. In the religions and cultures of all people, seeds and fragments of the one Logos are found, as the church fathers later and asserted. In a particular sense, according to the creation narratives, God has created all human beings in his image and likeness, so that regardless of their ethnical, cultural, religious, or national adherence, they each have their own unique dignity, which cannot be anyone's, at anyone's disposal. God, who reveals himself in his revelation as a mystery, safeguards at the same time the mystery and dignity of humanity. For Christians, Jesus Christ is a culmination of God's self-revelation. In him, the Logos, in which all things were created, became human being. So the fourth gospel calls him the light of the world. In this sense, for Christian, Jesus is a key to the interpretation of all reality and the foundation for interreligious dialogue. In the light of Jesus Christ and confessing him as a way, the truth, and the life, the church rejects nothing of what is true and holy in other religions. Also, they are different in many ways. They nevertheless reflect often a ray of set truth which enlightens all men. From this perspective, the debate about God becomes a debate about reality, or more precisely, a debate about whether belief or unbelief is better able to lead to an adequate understanding of reality. Cum granus salis, the task is then to prove that God's message is a true enlightenment of mankind and the world about itself. One of the most influential recent philosophers, and one of who does not come from a Christian tradition, but from the tradition of the modern enlightenment, Jürgen Habermas, has in more recent publications acknowledged that the religions, especially the Judeo-Christian tradition, have a potential for a language and interpretation of reality which should not be dispensed with in public discourse. We can go a step further and say, in binding himself or herself unconditionally to the one God alone, man becomes not a slave, but becomes free in the face of all other reality and all self-made gods and idols. So attachment to God and communion with God renders humans free with regard to all other reality. Even the most intimate unity with God in Jesus Christ does not extinguish or oppress the human reality. According to the famous dogma of Charles Seto in the fifth century, the divinity of Christ is intimately united with his humanity, but does not absorb his humanity, rather it sets it free. 
Proceeding from such insights, Christian theology has undergone a process of purification through a process of self-criticism and constructive confrontation with the modern enlightenment and modern philosophy of freedom. Modern philosophy can no longer be seen as a decadence. In modern philosophy, too, there are many seeds and fruits of Christian understanding of freedom so that we can enter into a constructive dialogue. It would be misplaced to read this new self-understanding of theology and the church as an expression of weakness or to even to suppose a cheap compromise. On the contrary, it is precisely the God of the Bible who addresses humanity in absolute freedom and invites it into communion with himself, opens up the possibility of thinking of the world as a place of freedom, to acknowledge freedom, to grant freedom to others, and to commit oneself to a social order based on freedom. Thus, Christian churches have overcome their former integralism and recognized with the Second Vatican Council the distinction between the church and state and the rightful autonomy of earthly affairs and of all spheres of secular culture, art, science, economy, politics, technology, etc., without falling into the opposite trap of secularism, which instead of a rightful distinction between both spheres, puts a separation and an opposition. This new attitude opens up the legitimate freedom of culture and sciences, the main Christian churches today no longer have difficulty in reconciling creation and evolution. This does not mean that Darwin becomes a new father of the church and evolution a new dogma. Evolution is and remains a scientific theory or hypothesis and not a matter of faith. So those who believe that, have, that they have the evidence can deny evolution but they cannot do it in the name of Christian faith. In this sense, theologians of all main churches now leave it to the fundamentalist Christians, as well as to fundamentalist atheistic movements discussed above, to see belief in creation and the theory of evolution as mutually exclusive alternatives, and to counter the theory of evolution with creationism a literal understanding of the biblical nar uh, creation narrative. Theology, which deserves to be taken seriously, knows how to distinguish the assertion of belief that God created the world from the scientific question how the origin and development of the world came about. Today, the question of political freedom has become much more controversial than the freedom of sciences. We have already looked at how all Christian churches profess freedom of religion, avoidance of violence, tolerance, and respect towards other religions, and how they make a distinction between religion and politics. They clearly affirm that the Christian faith does not allow a political program to be derived immediately from the gospel, but this does not mean limiting religion to the prior sphere, as laicism would like to have it, but it does wish to locate politics within the overarching horizon of freedom and promotion of freedom, justice, and solidarity, and to resist to a one-sided orientation of politics determined by economics and private interest. Pope Benedict XVI speaks in his last encyclical letter caritas in veritatem of the necessity of a new humanistic synthesis. Such a new humanistic synthesis resists a purely naturalistic understanding of mankind, which entails a purely objective view of the human being disregarding his or her inalienable dignity and personal subject. This danger is present today in debate in abortion and bioethical issues, in these debates it becomes clear that the Christian interpretation of the world and of human life is not at all harmless thing. 
Speaking of God, it defends at the same time the ultimate dignity of the human person. It takes up what is good, but at the same time it denounces all that is contrary to human dignity. Whereas the secularized understanding of freedom in the name of tolerance often becomes intolerant and oppressive. So today we are witnesses and agents in a battle not of freedom against stubborn Catholic conservative ideology, but in a battle on what freedom means and what a free society is all about. Speaking of God can be and must be the salt of the earth, light and power for the construction of a new humanism and a civilization of life and love. Third chapter, the triune God, a sympathetic God. Let me now come to a further point. In their commitment to human rights, justice, solidarity, and safeguarding of creation, Christians can and should work together with representatives of other religions and with all people of goodwill. But they also owe it to others to testify to the God of Jesus Christ, that is, the Trinitarian God, who is love. This brings us to an aspect of discourse about God which has been neglected for a long time. After a period resembling the sleep of sleeping beauty, beauty the doctrine of the Trinity and in Catholic and Protestant theology as well has regained actuality once more with regard both to historical research and systematic analysis alike. We are indebted for this also to orthodox theology. Nevertheless, there are also still problems of understanding this doctrine which seems for many to be far from their reality and hard to understand. There are also reservations and reserves for the sake of the interreligious dialogue with Judaism and Islam, which accuse Christianity of hidden polytheism. So we have to be careful in our interpretation. Self-evidently, the doctrine of Trinity is not a matter of numerical problem of a kind of higher mathematics attempting to show how one and the same reality can be one and three at the same time. The Trinity can only be made comprehensible as among others, Augustine and Bonaventure saw and great idealistic thinkers like Hegel have shown again, it can be understood on the basis of the nature of love. Love wants to be one with the other without dissolving into the other. Love does not absorb the other. It means being one while maintaining its own identity as well as the identity of the other. It is so to say the paradox of love to find its, his or her ultimate fulfillment by being one with the other while acknowledging at the same time the otherness of the other. But it does not stop at ultimate duality but instead progresses beyond its own boundaries into a shared third entity in which it represents and fully realizes itself. In this sense, the doctrine of the Trinity is a precise explication of the biblical expression, God is love. God is not a solitary God. He is in himself communion, koinonio, communio, and only thus, can he bring us into his communion with him and with one another, and just in this way fulfill the ultimate desire of the human heart. In a Trinitarian perspective, freedom and communion are inseparably, inseparably linked. Freedom exists in communion, and communion is the realm of freedom. This is much more than pious, pious rhetoric. On the contrary, the doctrine of the Trinity enables us a new approach to the most difficult existential question of the doctrine of God. 
the problem of theodicy. It mean, I mean the question, why is there so much innocent suffering? How can God, if he is omnipotent and loving, permit such suffering? Why does he not intervene? If he is loving, but not almighty, then he is not God. If he is almighty, but not loving, then he is an evil demon. Such questions have become a burning issue again with such tragic experiences as the Shoah. They also arise when we are confronted with natural disasters such as tsunamis, earthquakes, and other catastrophes. Obviously, the doctrine of Trinity cannot solve such questions. Nobody can answer them. Faith too must bear up under the darkness of God's unfathomable mystery, as the book of Job tells us in its final chapters. But faith can shine a light in the darkness, and it can help us to survive the darkness of suffering and dying. It can show a great literature has always known that love and renunciation, love and death belong together. That is true also of Trinitarian love. The divine persons are, like everything in God, infinite. They must therefore make room for one another. They must, as it were, relinquish themselves to make space for the other person. And this kind canonic self-relinquishing mode of existence enables God on the cross to identify himself with that which is most alien to him and to enter into his opposite, into the night of death. God can take this death upon himself without being conquered by it, but instead thereby vanquish it and establish the foundation of a new life. Thus, the cross is the utmost that is possible to God in his self-relinquishing love. It is the it bomaius cogitari nequit. The doctrine of the Trinity does not thereby give a direct answer to the question of innocent suffering. How could it? But it, enables, it is able to be light in the darkness that helps us not to despair of God in our utmost need and distress, but to know that in our extreme helplessness, the crucified God stands by us, so that in all our cries and despair, the de profundis, we are able to bear all in faith. The doctrine of Trinity is a form of monotheism which permits existential survival in the face of the enormous extent of suffering in the world. But can God suffer? Can he suffer with us? <coughs> the mainstream of traditional theology has always denied this. It has understood suffering as a deficit and therefore excluded to the possibility that God could suffer. On this point, a shift has occurred in a large part of more modern theology, Orthodox, Protestant, and Catholic as well. Self-evidently, if God suffers, he does not suffer in a human, but in a divine manner. For God's suffering cannot be something external which befalls him. God's suffering cannot be a passive accident, nor can it be the expression of a deficiency, but only the expression of a sovereign self-determination. God is not passively affected by the suffering of his creatures. He allows himself in freedom to be affected by the suffering of his creatures. He allows himself to be moved by sympathy. Indeed, as the prophet says, his heart recoils in the face of the misery of his creatures. The prophet is Hosea. He is not an apathetic, but a sympathetic God. It means a God who can sympathize, who suffers with us. 
Gott das nicht glorified oder deified suffering, nor does he simply eliminate it. He redeems and transforms it. The cross is a passage to resurrection and transfiguration. So the theology of the cross in Genesis, conceptualized in Trinitarian terms, become an Easter theology of transfiguration. It becomes hope against hope in the living God who gives life. Spe salvi. We are saved by hope. We are redeemed by hope. This is the title of the second encyclical of Pope Benedict XVI. Now to speak of hope brings us still a step further. For hope stretches out not only to, the, to engage personal fulfillment and happiness, but also to the fulfillment and the well-being of the whole of reality in justice and peace, what the Hebrew Bible calls shalom. God is the creator of heaven and earth, he is not a reality apart the world, he is all determining reality. So if we take seriously the words that God is love, then their logical conclusion is that love is the all-encompassing horizon of reality and the meaning of existence. With this, we have the thesis that love is the horizon and the interpretive key for all reality. This thesis that love is a meaning of existence is not just any harmless, pious affirmation. It respects a kind of revolution in the field of metaphysical thought. This insight leads us to the realization that neither the self-subsistent substance of the classical metaphysics nor the autonomous modern self-assured subject are the real and fundamental reality. The starting point and the foundation are instead to be found in that what was for Aristotle merely accidental and the weakest reality of existence, namely relation. The theology of the Trinity leads us, as many contemporary theologians teach us, to a relational and personal ontology. Just as God's just in, as in God's subsistence of the Trinitarian persons is grounded in relation, so in an analogous manner, it means in a similarity which is at the same time more dissimilar. In a similar, in such an analogous manner, relations are the fundamental reality also in the created realm. The human being must form this perspective be understood as a rel relational and dialogical being. He does not find his fulfillment in forcible self-assertion, but in respectful recognition of the otherness of the other and in loving self-communication. Where he or she makes him or herself a gift for the other and receives love as undeserved gift from the other. This is a fundamental paradox and dialectic of Christian existence. Only he who loses his life will find it. Only in love and in communion does freedom find its fulfillment. Pope Benedict spoke of the logic of gift as a principle of graciousness. Communion is therefore the realm where freedom is only possible and fulfilled. This is a position which goes beyond individualism and collectivism. Some go so far to tell it as to tell communio as a new paradigm to understand all of reality. This principle of communio stands also behind the concept of a communio ecclesiology which, on the basis of patristic and orthodox theology in the past decades, and in both Catholic and Protestant theology, ecclesiology, has emerged progressively as a promising ecumenically common approach. But communio ecclesiology cannot and should not remain a theory 
or become even an ideology, it must find its way into ecclesial practice, both at intra and at extra. At intra, in communication on all levels of church, that which orthodox theology calls synodality. At extra, in dialogue and solidarity with the joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of humanity in our times. Moreover, the church does not find her identity in her rightly understood Catholicity, but anxiously closing her doors and windows, but on the contrary, by opening them and entering into dialogue with other faiths, never abandoning her own faith, but making it inviting, convincing, lively, and fruitful. This can be done in a trustworthy and credible way only when the relations at extra reflect the internal life of the church, it means communion and communication, solidarity and subsidiarity within the church herself. In a relational ontology, identity can be understood only as an open identity combined with solidarity. This means that neither personal nor national distinction, neither ethnic affiliation or neither at even academic greatness, nor force, money, power and influence, nor the self-assertion of the fittest will be what counts in the end, but instead tolerance, respect, solidarity, forgiveness, goodness, and tangible love will be what remains as a definitive reality. Thus the doctrine of God and the Trinity gives rise to perspectives which by no means have not yet been taken to their logical, ontological, ecclesiological, and practical social conclusion. Thought on the doctrine of God and the Trinity as a sum of all theology represents a big challenge and an unfulfilled and rewarding task. So I can sum up. It is time to speak of God to testify and to think about God. If theology wishes to gain a hearing amidst the contemporary pluralistic babel of voices and opinions, it must firstly and above all know what it is. It can only have relevance if it steadfastly maintains its own identity, that it is a speaking of God in a distinctive and at the same time in an engaging manner. If it does so, it, if it does not do so, theology and the church will be relegated to the role of ethical and moral institutions, which in the end no one wants to listen to. If one, on the other hand, speaks in a new and a fresh way on, of the living God, who is love, then it will render a service to life, freedom, justice, solidarity, and love. Then it can serve the dignity of humanity and the truths of reality and open up perspectives of hope in all the aporia of the present. Therefore, I reiterate the timelessness of theology. For the sake of man, it is time it is the right time to speak of God. Thank you. Your Eminence, thank you very much.
for a most moving presentation with lots of challenges for us all, especially the Christian community. You say in your presentation that violence is an offense to God and all human dignity. And you end with eloquent words about tolerance and respect, solidarity, forgiveness, goodness, and tangible love will be what remains as the definitive reality. Part of our mutual history as Christians is that uh, through the ages, our churches have at times been violators of these sentiments that you've expressed. And we have uh, been involved in sanctioning violence, commi even committing violence. Yes. And one of the uh, most horrific illustrations of that is our behavior towards our Jewish brothers and sisters through most of Christian history. I believe uh, Pope John Paul II called the Shoah or the Holocaust the Calvary of the 20th century, which is a very deep theological understanding for those of us who are Christians. You had your formation as a theologian in the 20th century at a time when Christians and Jews had terrible conflict. And I'm wondering if you can tell us your personal journey as a person who has come to be one of the world's leaders in helping to bridge the difference between Christians and Jews and to help begin to bring greater understanding between Christians and Jews. How did you personally come to believe that that was a great mission for yourself? Thank you very much. Of course, you are right. The churches and all churches were often agents of violence among each other to the Jewish people and to other people also. And uh, tolerance and respect was not only, always uh, the mark of the church, and we have to confess it and to be honest on this point and to come also to some conversion. So for me, it was a very moving experience when in the first Sunday of Lent 2000, at the beginning of the new millennium, Pope John Paul II, in the Sunday service in St. Peter's, expressed all this bad deeds which happened also in the church and through the church. And we have to say it, but I think we learned also from all this, and unfortunately, it needed the Shoah, this terrible event, that absolute evil, uh, to come to a new relationship with the Jews. Well, I grew up in Germany, and it was very afraid first when I was mandated to have the, be responsible for the relations with the Jews. I think how I said German, with all the baggage of German people, can do it. I must say, my Jewish friends, never let me feel anything of it. And it, it was possible to uh, build up atmosphere of trust, sometimes also of friendship. For, well, for me it was important what the Second Federal Council said, the, de uh, the declaration on Nostra Etate, first of all. We have common roots. Christianity is rooted in the Old Testament. We have the prophets, we have the fathers together, we have the Ten Commandments, we have the hope, it's the theological hope together. And so it's a, a big basis and we have to the Jewish people a relation, a unique relation. We have to know other religion. And this, there cannot be a hostility. There's a difference between both, of course, but not a hostility. We belong together, we are the one people of God, this inside helped me, and then also the Second Vatican Council was very clear, saying that uh, 
Christians have to abandon and to condemn also all kinds of un, uh, anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. And some weeks ago only, in his uh, visit in the synagogue of Rome, the present Holy Father, was present, uh, reaffirmed this and said, this is an unreversible declaration of the council, we cannot go back behind it. And so I started to build up uh, bonds, relations of trust, and that's always a precondition for every dialogue, also for the ecumenical dialogue. You cannot only have uh, papers, papers is dead and you can produce it also for the bookshelves and for the next for some promotion uh, doctoral thesis. But what counts is to build up personal relations. And I must say, I learned a lot of our Jewish uh, pastors and sisters. On one of the last visits I paid to Jerusalem, I visited all academic institutions of our side, from Dominican, Franciscan, Jesuits, on biblical studies. And he was amazed. All of this have today very close relationship with the Hebrew University of scholars about uh, contemporary uh, Judaism. And this has changed the whole Jesus research. When I was a young student, uh, Bultmann was important, uh, the relations to Hellenistic thought, to Gnosticism. Today, the re Jesus is put in the framework of the contemporary Jewish uh, situation. And so it was theological insight, it was his personal relationship, and this enabled me and my collaborators then in some situations of crisis and of course, it would be surprising that there will not sometimes a crisis between the church and Jewish people after this long, complicated and complex history and the play, uh, remaining differences. But uh, if there is trust, they can phone to them, I can write a letter to them, and normally in two weeks we have solved uh, uh, the problems. Perhaps they do not fully agree with us, but they respect our position and we respect their critique and so we recognize each other in our otherness and they are very wonderful experiences we made. After some time, Jewish leaders came to me and said, well, we have now spoken a lot about the past. The past is the past, we cannot forget it. It's important to remind uh, the memory of uh, the Shoah for the first generation as a warning for the future. So it must be a part of education but we have no challenges today, and we must face together the challenges of hunger, of injustice, of peace in the world, and we started this way, and we found we have common ground, the Ten Commandments we have together, and if everybody in this world would at least try to live a little bit according to the Ten Commandments, the world would be a little bit uh, different as it is now. And so we try to do this to, against AIDS we did in South Africa, against the hunger at this time of economic crisis in Argentina and many other things. And so it was a real friendship which uh, grew up, knowing about our diversity, remaining diversity, that's clear, but recognizing each other as a one people of God, which has a common mission to make a difference in this world, and especially in common, we have in common hope, the prophetic message. And I think there's a scarcity of hope in our world, and Jews and Christians can also be an example. And also after such a complex, difficult history, reconciliation, cooperation are possible. And I think that's a powerful science in midst all these very dangerous conflict, conflicts we face in our times. Thank you. This is a question from the audience and the ushers are collecting questions. In an American society that is based more and more on an individualistic religiosity where more and more are self-absorbed in their own entertainment devices, how can we move to communio? 
Well, we can uh, change uh, our societies only if we change our own life. And to give an example of uh, communio, and to, uh, to uh, live ex communio and to show communio as a sign, it has always an attractive and inviting power. And so we should just, everybody should start with himself. Unfortunately, at this moment, all churches are very engaged in inner problems and structural problems of their own. And they forget a little bit to look about their own uh, boundaries and I think there we should start and to see and show, and we can show, that communio gives very, very fulfillment of our existence because uh, a, a merely individualistic and uh, uh, egoistic uh, uh, conduct of life uh, does never give us the fulfillment of its own life. So build up communio, start with it in little communities. And this was also the way St. Paul did it. For St. Paul relied very much in his missionary work on so-called so house churches. Uh, and this was the way the Christi Christianity spread over all the world. Also, the best is always a witness of life and to show this is very really fulfilling uh, their own existence and can help to the world. Thank you. Could you name some of the ethical issues in which the battle for human freedom today is, from your point of view, fought out? Are those issues different in the United States of America compared to other countries of the world? Well, I cannot uh, permit myself to say too much about the uh, needs here in the United States. I come sometimes as a visitor and uh, know to listen, but I, th I think it's the whole Western world. There are similar challenges and similar uh, problems. Uh, and one problem is uh, respect for human life, for every human life. From the first moment is a natural death. It's a very important uh, challenge for the church today. Then the challenge of solidarity against the growing egoism and uh, this uh, gulf, this gap, which becomes always broader between the majority of poor people, it's a great majority in our world, and the minority of rich people. And this gap is also evident here in the States, but it is everywhere evident in the world. I was, when I was bishop in Germany, resp uh, responsible for the relationship with the so-called third world, and I had many experiences of uh, poverty and misery, of favelas and so on in the world. And I think this is something which is not tolerable. And it cannot be for the peace of the world. It will not, it cannot, uh, maintain, cannot remain in this way. This will lead us to a very deep uh, conflict if we Christians give not a sign of uh, reconversion, of uh, solidarity uh, in the um, distribution of the goods of creation which belong to all people. So, so uh, also, uh, the safeguarding of life solidarity, and I think uh, self-guarding, uh, self uh, no, salvation of the, crea uh, yes, uh, of the creation, of, uh, of uh, so all these env uh, environment problems. I think this is a very important, uh, it's uh, not so much for our generation, but we have also to think in solidarity for future generations. We have to leave a world where you can survive in a human way in this world. And that is a big uh, challenge uh, for us all. And here also the rich nations have to begin because they are the com consumers of the richness and the goods of the world. Thank you, Your Eminence. I think we'll have two more questions, if you'll allow us. Um, one is, how does the uh, Roman Catholic Church speak out against the oppression of women in non-Catholic and non-Christian cultures? 
Well, you could comment on how we do it in Christian cultures too. That would be fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, this is also a, po a point. Uh, I think also the churches uh, had a learning process behind uh, themselves and. Uh, the Catholic and the Christian view here is, uh, is equality. Women and men are not the same, but this equality of dignity. And, and uh, there's a reciproc uh, reciproc reciprocity between both. And I have the impression that the teaching of the last popes at this point is uh, very clear and it's. Uh, in Europe, it becomes very important now. We are very much faced by Islam and uh, the status of women have in Islam. And here, I think the church is very clear on this uh, point uh, that uh, to give women their dignity and also their role. Also within the church, when I was a bishop for 10 years in Germany, it was one of my main concerns to create a commission of women, how to promote uh, uh, women in the church. It's not my task as a bishop to make the suggestions, but I think I got a lot of suggestions of the commission of, of women, how to promote uh, the role of women within the church. This depends not only from the ordination of women, that's only one point. There are many f functions uh, possible in the church which are very important, very decisive and uh, influential in today's church. And I think there is still a lot uh, to do, in, not only in theoretical recognition, but also in uh, practical consequence. And perhaps also in the Vatican, women could have a much bigger role than they have at this moment. <laughs> I think we can only say amen to that one. <laughs> I just want to thank all those in the audience who bothered to write questions. I have a handful of very rich ones. Uh, so thank you for your thoughts. But given the time that we have left in the evening tonight, I'll ask one more. And my apologies to the one who wrote the question. Um, I'll deviate a little bit from it. We note recently that the Pope opened the door to all of those who are dissident members of the Episcopal Church in the United States and other Anglicans who find themselves unhappy with the state of their church. And in return, the Episcopal Church opened its doors widely to all the Catholics who are dissatisfied with the state of their church. Is this a new form of practical ecumenism? No, it's not. <laughs> no. Well, what the Pope did was an answer to a request coming from the Anglican side. There were bishops, priests, and laity who came to Rome. They came first to me, and they said, well, I'm not responsible for this. Go to the doctrine of faith. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. And there were long uh, negotiations between uh, members of the Congregation for Doctrine of Faith and these representatives. There were also bishops from, one bishop from the United States, Catholic bishop, one Catholic bishop from uh, Great Britain and one from Australia were involved in this discussion and there the things was uh, discussed and then the Pope made this offer on Anglican request. It's, it's not an activity for us, not an proselytizing, not fishing in other men's uh, <laughs> lake. And well, now it's on them to decide whether they will accept this or not accept this, do this uh, step. Uh, well, I had, uh, I was at this time when it was announced this uh, new um, uh, papal uh, statement. 
I was in Cyprus and the Archbishop of Canterbury, we are good friends with each other, there is no problem. Call me up, to, it's a night, and to, to speak at night in, in English, it was not so easy. I, I explained it a little bit, and I said, well, this is not ecumenism. That is when anybody wants to join our church, but we cannot shut the door. Is as also the Anglican community cannot shut the door if anybody with good reasons of his conscience, that's position, wants to come. And this must be recognized by all church, but that's not the ecumenism. Ecumenism is the official dialogue between church, and we will continue with this dialogue of Archich, so the dialogue with the Anglican community court. And then he answered on the night and on the phone, that's a real message for me. And he was very happy about this, and then he came to Rome, had a long audience with the Holy Father, and the Holy Father confirmed the same. No, no, we go on with our ecumenical dialogue as we did now, but if there are Anglicans, we do not feel happy about what's happening in the Anglican Commune, want, by reasons of conscience, uh, uh, join our church, of course, they are welcome as some Catholics, especially here in the States, uh, want to join the Anglican Church. Nobody, no church can be pleased by this, it's clear. But we had to recognize that religious freedom. But the ecumenical movement was, uh, is independent from this, and therefore we are not competent for this, but the doctrine of faith, and there's different competencies also in the Holy See. Of course, we were involved, we were informed about this all, but, well, there some were a little bit enthusiastic at the beginning in Rome, and I said to them, well, well, well <laughs> remain with your feet on earth. Uh, this will not be a mass, uh, mass movement of Anglicans become, some spoke with a half a million of Anglicans is coming. <laughs> half. <laughs> uh, slowly, slowly, this would be a small group, but of course, if they want, and say, they are welcome. And in the meantime, I think the waves are, have calmed uh, down again, and uh, our relations uh, with Canterbury, because they are our immediate partners, not the Episcopal Church here. The Episcopal Church has a dialogue with the Conf uh, Bishop's Conference. Uh, um, with uh, Canterbury, the dialogue goes on in a very peaceful way, and we open this a new round uh, of dialogues in the Archic uh, uh, meetings. Of course, in a, as, this belongs also to ecumenism. When an other church or church communion is in difficulties, then we should help each other. Uh, or not be all, oh, no, I say, and Papel and I say, well, come. That's not, the, that's not ecumenical. To help, that's also solidarity. And it happens also in this case, the Archbishop, sometime, several times, phoned me or write me, can you not write me something, and I will publish it. Something. And I did it all the time, and he was grateful, and so we help each other also our, in our difficulties, and he asked me sometimes, what is she do there and there? And, well, it goes, he was a professor, I was a professor, so it's also a, co a collegial relation between us, and uh, so we help each other how to manage this situation, which is very difficult for the Anglican communion, uh, especially here in the United States, but we cannot directly intervene from our side. Also, so ecumenism functions and not in this kind of mutual uh, proselytism. Proselytism is no method, no strategy of the Catholic Church and neither of the Anglican Communion. Your Eminence, we thank you from the depths of our hearts for your being with us tonight. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.